Saturday City Council meeting. Our meetings are public and you're welcome to join us in person or by watching from the Council's agenda page, Zoom, Facebook, YouTube or SLC TV. We hope you'll continue to join us in whatever manner you feel most comfortable. Today is a work session meeting and although we have a limited formal meeting tonight, there is no public comment scheduled for today's formal meeting. Please join us on September 19th, a week from today, 2023, during our 7 p.m. formal meeting to share your comments. We, of course, welcome your feedback anytime by mail to P.O. Box 145476, Salt Lake City 84114, or by email at council.comments at slcgov.com, or via our 24-hour phone comment line 801-535-7654. Written comments we receive on agenda topics are shared with council members and posted to our website, slccouncil.com. Now we will begin our work session. The first item on our agenda is updates from the administration. Tim Cosgrove from the mayor's office is here. And then we have Andrew Johnson online and Laura Briefer as well, director of public utilities, or oh, yes, public utilities. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Nice to be with you here this afternoon, this evening. Tim right, Cosgrove you, from the mayor's office. So, sorry, to Tim, do the could update. you just press the, is, make sure the light screen on the microphone, please. Thank you. Um, as, you're, as you're aware, we have the community engagement feedback, feedback page that you can always check on, see our latest surveys, uh, and provide feedback, feedback to our office. Uh, next slide. We're, we'll go right into this last week, our Salt Lake City Corps, Volunteer Corps led in very inspirational weekend of service and recognition of 9-11, the National Day of Service and Remembrance. Our office assisted in coordinating dozens of projects for hundreds of volunteers to unite as a community. All across our city, folks came together to write letters to first responders, pack hygiene kits, beautify parks, clean up alleyways, plant trees, and so much more. The mayor's office joined the ballpark residents and spent the morning beautifying people's freeway park and cleaning up an alleyway in the neighborhood. We are especially grateful to our partners, uh, my hometown, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and the ballpark community for all their contributions. Um, you can learn more about those volunteer opportunities by looking at our volunteer core uh, link on the mayor's website. Next slide. Um, as you know, we do mayor's community office hours where the mayor's liaisons go out into the community to engage and interact, interface with the constituents so that we're not just waiting in the office for phone calls and people to come see us. Um, these are our locations for what's left uh, for the rest of the month. I know Josh and I will both be at 9th and 9th Street Festival, which happens to be at Liberty Park this, this weekend. Um, Davis Park, Salt Lake City Main Library, Sorensen Multicultural Unity Center, and Madsen Park. And next slide. Some of the September event highlights that we have still coming up. These are sponsored ACE events. We have the Sand Light, Sand Lot movie, exciting Sand Lot movie at Jefferson Park. It's about 1250 Southwest Temple. That's this Friday. And again, the Street Festival, 9th and 9th at Liberty Park on the northeast corner. Uh, the fifth annual LGB, LGTBQ Economic Summit is September 21st. The Marmalade Jam, you don't want to miss out on that one. Council member, yeah, he'll be there. And uh, Madsen Fall Fest and uh, Groove in the Grove. That's all I have for me. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Councilmember, any questions for Tim? If not, I think we'll go to Andrew from Homelessness Policy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Direction. You can see on the screen uh, still uh, very high utilization rates of the resource centers. Uh, we, I would anticipate that's going to continue through the balance of the, the fall into the winter overflow season. Uh, speaking of that, we are about one month away uh, from opening St. Vincent de Paul, uh, generally about the 15th of October, 
And I would anticipate sequentially the other overflow options for the winter opening up starting that week uh, forward into November. You can see also the uh, Fifth West and Rio Grande area is on tap for encampment uh, impact mitigation work uh, this week and a number of camps still across the city. The VOA outreach team, I think I mentioned this last time, uh, has seen uh, a turnover in their staff, which happens periodically, just not generally all at once. And so they've been really down in numbers. So other engagements have gone down, but I anticipate those will go back up again in the next month or so. Um, Pioneer Park had a resource fair last week, went very well, and we can get your details of that. And thank you to Councilman Rivaldo Moros and her office for so many uh, efforts across this year and, and going forward in those events. And then Kayak Court is uh, Friday the 22nd this month, and we would anticipate there'll be one more Kayak Court in October for the year and shut it down until the spring at that point. I believe that's all the updates today. Uh, any questions, Mr. Chair or Council Members? Council Members, any questions for Andrew? It doesn't look like it. Thank you so much for your work on this and for your updates every week. And then we have Laura Briefer, the director of our public utilities department. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I think I have a presentation to pull up, but I could do it without a presentation as well. There we go. I'm just doing a brief uh, drought and water supply update. Um, actually, I was looking back on my records, and my last update to all of you was uh, this same week last year. <laughs> so we have some interesting comparisons that we can make between this year and last year. Um, you'll see on my cover uh, slide, we've got Great Salt Lake showing at its current levels, which is still far below what is um, ideal for Great Salt Lake. Uh, next slide, please. So our drought and climate status, um, we are nearing the end of the water year, which is October 1st. The water year typically starts April 1st. Um, I have some uh, figures on the right hand of the slide that shows the drought status this week last year. Um, the dark red means extreme drought. Um, uh, on the top, and then the bottom uh, shows the state of Utah's current drought status, which you can see most of the drought status has been removed, um, particularly in our region. Um, so last winter's snowpack made a really big difference, removing what's called the meteorological drought status from uh, most of Utah on the U.S. drought monitor. However, there's different types of drought status um, that the uh, National Weather Service recognizes. Um, other types of drought are hydrological, agricultural, and socioeconomic. Um, we are currently still in a hydrological drought given the levels of Great Salt Lake. And I think that's important. Great Salt Lake is up about four feet, four feet from the low point last year due to um, the bountiful snowpack we had. Um, it was at 4188 feet above mean sea level last year and currently sits at 4192 above mean sea level. Um, that is still below the level needed for most environmental and economic indicators for Great Salt Lake. Um, I did look ahead uh, for the next few months. The National Weather Service has a really interesting modeling tool that looks at precipitation and temperature. Both of those things are really important as we um, continue to monitor what happens over the next water year. Um, and the good news right now is from October through December, they are forecasting um, equal chances of average above or below precipitation. Um, this time last year, it was uh, all below average um, forecast. So that's pretty good news for us. We'll continue to monitor that. Uh, however, temperature is expected to be of above average through December. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we'll focus in on Salt Lake City's water supply for our service area. And uh, at this time and this year, water supply is adequate to meet demand. Um, our Wasatch Front stream flows are normal, which is great news. Uh, as we do every summer, we are using groundwater resources to make up some demand, too. And Deer Creek Reservoir is at 90% full. Uh, last year at this time, it was 45% full. Um, so that's also good news. Uh, you can see the, the map of um, many of our uh, local reservoirs in the Bear, Weber, and Provo River basins and, and where they're sitting. And overall, they're sitting pretty well. 
Uh, next slide, please. A few statistics on Salt Lake City's water demand. Um, we calculated between April 1st and September 7th that our service area has saved over 1 billion gallons of water um, compared to the average of the last three years. Uh, the graph on the right-hand side of the slide shows um, on the y-axis um, the amount of water used in million gallons per day and on the x-axis the months of the year from January through December. Um, the light blue line is water use in the year 2000. The red line is the average of the last three years and the dark blue shaded area is uh, the water use to date um, this year. So you can see we're well below um, our baseline year of the year 2000 and we are below um, the average of the last three years. Um, I thought it'd be interesting to share some statistics since the baseline year. Um, so since the year 2000, the population estimate uh, grew 15%. Um, over our entire service area between 2000 and, and present day. Our overall water use demand, however, decreased by 31%, and our per capita use across the service area decreased by 40%. And so you can see the impact of uh, conservation across our community. Uh, of course, there's still more to do, um, but that's really good news. Um, we entered into stage two of our water shortage contingency plan last year based on um, drought, and we have not yet, uh, I have not yet made a, re a recommendation to move from stage two. Um, you might recall that stage two of our water shortage contingency plan um, is still voluntary conservation for most in our community, for residents and um, uh, commercial users but mandatory water conservation for institutional and government users. And it still felt appropriate to me that we remain in stage two given lake levels of Great Salt Lake. Um, we'll be evaluating that again after this uh, winter to see what our snowpack looks like. And next slide, this is my final slide. Um, just a few water conservation tips for the fall. Um, things that people can do to um, reduce water use and start um, uh, planning for the, the winter and next spring. Um, adjusting your irrigation for cooler weather is uh, really important right now and you can see um, the chart on the right of the uh, slide is from the State Division of Water Resources recommendations for weekly lawn watering for this week and for Salt Lake County it's one irrigation per week. So anywhere in our service area, that is the recommendation if you're watering a lawn. Um, you could also start planning a water-wise landscape for next year. Um, you could see if you qualify for a lawn removal rebate program. And there's lots of great information on those programs at utahwatersavers.com. Um, checking indoor plumbing is also always a good idea. And then we have lots and lots of research, resources on our slc.gov slash utilities website um, for additional information and uh, also with respect to the new water maps um, uh, uh, tool that we're providing to our residents. And that concludes my water supply update today. Thank you, Director Briefer. Council members? All right, appreciate that. Good job, Salt Lake City Saving Water. Let's keep at it. Uh, item number two on our work session is an ordinance about our anti-gentrification and displace displacement plan called Thriving in Place. Allison Rowland from council staff will give us a brief introduction. And then we have Angela Price here, the direct policy director from Community Neighborhoods. I see Blake Thomas and a couple others here um, in the audience. Allison, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is an opportunity to, for the council to ask questions, provide feedback, and discuss whether the city's anti-displacement plan, known as Thriving in Place, is ready to consider for adoption. The Planning Commission unanimously recommended adoption in its July meeting. You have a public hearing scheduled on October 3rd and potential action on, Octo on October 17th. 
in the most recent conversations that you've had on this document, the council rec requested the department to focus specifically on developing policies for a two-year action plan and devising alternatives to the existing housing loss mitigation ordinance. These are both included in this full version of the plan, and it also outlines what would be needed for implementation. This would include ordinance changes, ongoing state level advocacy, new community partnerships, and budget and staffing increases. And the budget needs are significant for the full implementation of this plan. Some of the proposed policies and programs would be entirely new, and others would build on city work that is already underway, but they may be modified or expanded significantly. And any of the near-term action priorities that require council action will be transmitted separately by the department. The staff report on this item lists potential policy questions for the council, um, both scattered throughout and at the end. And you could request standalone briefings on some of the proposals in the plan. And there's a list of, of ones that we believe you may be interested in in the policy question section at the end. And you may wish to have a standalone briefing on the potential sources of new funds for the programs and policies recommended. Um, and that's covered in near-term priority 4A. So with that introduction, I'll pass it on to Angela. Thank you, Allison. Um, can you guys hear me OK? Yes, we can. Perfect. Um, Mr. Chair, if it's OK, I'd like to propose that I spend about 15 minutes going through our slides, really kind of talking about the mechanics of the plan, and then take some time afterwards for your questions and to dive into the policies deeper. Does that seem like an OK plan for you? Uh, that'd be great. And I think if Perfect. we can just focus on the policies today, yep. uh, we know you've done a ton of engagement, and, yep. uh, and we've heard about that. But if we can focus on the policies today, that will maybe Great. maximize our time. Yeah, that's, Thank that's you. the intention here. So um, I have David Driscoll, the consultant that has been the project lead um, online. So we have him here for the next hour or so to answer any questions as well. Um, this plan has been a culmination of work by a city stakeholder team with representatives from almost a single department a project team that consists of our consultants and what I call our A team, which was which was the RDA, the planning division, and um, CAN admin. We have a community working group that was over 30 representatives, and over 2,500 residents have weighed in on this plan. This plan truly is a community-driven plan um, that we should be really excited about um, implementing. We um, would also like to thank Mayor Mendenhall for her vision as she took office to understand displacement pressures in Salt Lake City and for the council um, and the mayor's leadership over the past four years we've seen over a 400 percent increase in the investment in housing. The data that I presented back in December and January is staggering but it would be far worse if it wasn't for the work of this body and this so I just want to give some gratitude there. Um, you can go to slide the next slide, please. Or am I able to advance these on my own? No, okay. Um, I'm just going to turn that so I can see it better. Um, as I said, this is a community-driven plan to understand displacement and develop a plan of action. The two-year plan we have here, or the um, placemat that you have in front of you, is a roadmap that will um, serve as a foundation for you as you're making policy decisions around housing um, in the coming years. Next slide. Uh, the plan was developed into two phases. We briefed you on phase one back in December and January. That was the listening and learning where we went through the community engagement and the data. This is phase two where we have the actual policy solutions before you. Next slide, please. This, um, again, I'm not going to go into the details here, but what's really exciting about this is we had over 2,500 people weigh in on this while we were concurrently also working on the city's five-year housing plan, Housing SLC. One of my favorite parts of this project is the pictures from the seven youth workshops where we engaged youth in our um, west side communities to understand what their um, neighborhood meant to them. So this again this plan really is driven by our residents next slide please 
Um, we also analyzed and mapped data on displacement, and I know when we saw this data back in December, it was staggering for all of us and, and really a call to action on what um, we knew was happening in Salt Lake, but also what's happening in the region. This data is not unique to the capital city. It is the exact same from Brigham City all the way down to Provo. So while we are leading out on this, this is a statewide and a regional issue. Next slide, please. Um, you'll see um, the hash marks here again showing areas where we have high displacement and that there are no more affordable tracks, not just in Salt Lake City, but cities throughout the entire region. We only have two tracks that people can go to if they're displaced in Utah. Next slide, please. The key takeaways are displacement pressures are high in Salt Lake City and getting worse. Displacement is impacting many people, specifically communities of color. There are no affordable neighborhoods to move to where displacement is not happening, and there is not enough housing overall and a severe lack of affordable units. Next slide, please. The challenges. Um, people see new housing as part of the problem, and you guys see that often as you have rezones coming before you. Um, they see city policies and practices as part of the problem, and a lot of the work that we did in phase one was breaking down those narratives that um, we have in some of our neighborhoods here, rightfully so. The government is the government, and they don't understand, some of our residents don't understand that there are policies that the city can, has control over, and there are policies that the state has control over. Um, there has been a heavy focus on housing production and not much on the preservation of existing housing and tenant protections. And again, the impetus of this plan was really to understand the, um, the loss of naturally occurring affordable housing in Salt Lake City and mitigate that loss. And I can say that um, working on housing policy at the state level, we've been so heavily focused on production and not focus on keeping people in housing, and those conversations are finally starting to happen, not just here in Salt Lake City, but at the state level as well. And then displacement is happening now, and many of the fixes are gonna take years for us to achieve. Redlining happened decades ago, and it's gonna take us a long time to be able to undo those policies um, that divided our, our city and many cities across the country. Next slide, please. So what's the plan? We want to help our lower income tenants stay in place. We want to create more affordable housing and we want to partner with our impacted communities. We need to be both pro-tenant and pro-housing at the same time. So that means that we want to protect our tenants, we want them to stay in their existing housing, and we also need to be creating more housing, specifically those really deeply affordable units that are so hard to make pencil that really only happen through those public-private partnerships. Next slide, please. So um, we have broken this into several um, kind of high level goals, again, helping ten lower income tenants stay in place um, by increasing our tenant resources. Some of these things you guys have already started doing, making it easier to access resources and services, creating more affordable housing by incentivizing the development of those deeply affordable units and the preservation of our existing naturally occurring affordable housing, and then partnering with impacted communities communities and others. We heard from so many residents that they want to stay engaged in this process and they want to be part of the solutions. Next slide, please. Um, it's important to keep in mind that there are no magic fixes and our success is going to be incremental. State preemption was hands down one of the biggest challenges that we encountered in drafting the 22 policies in this plan. We have a finite amount of resources in capacity within the city, and there are so many forces like market, um, minimum wage caps, and um, child care costs that are beyond our control. And um, we need to work differently. We need to work together, and we're starting to see those partnerships forming um, both within the city but within our community partners as well. Next, uh, next slide, please. 
So we have um, the action framework, which again is the play, what we've coined as the placemat, placemat in front of you. It consists of six interrelated goals to protect tenants from displacement, preserve the affordable housing we have, and produce more housing. Expanding funding, partnering and collabor collaborating and advocating for tenants at the state level. Next slide, please. Um, again, laid out here before you are the 22 goals. It's important to note that this is a foundational plan. This is not saying that we have all of the answers on how each one of these policies are going to be developed. We, the focus of Thriving in Place is really to set the foundation and the roadmap for these 22 policies. And these will be coming before this body through um, potential budget requests in the future, through ordinances, through resolutions. Some of these are already existing. Some of them will be new. So um, I think it's important to focus on that this is the roadmap that will help us guide where we want to be headed for our anti-displacement strategies in the future. Next slide, please. Um, within the plan, we have a purpose, context, steps, lead partner, schedule, resources, food for thought, and near-term priority. When we drafted this RFP, we had several really strong intentions. A, we didn't want this to be a plan that sat on the shelf. This work is way too important for us to have a 500 page document that we spend copious amounts of time drafting that we aren't able to actually digest. We wanted this to um, provide the framework for us to be able to know what our steps are to be able to do this work and to have best practices. And we also wanted to have buy-in from all of the departments within the city that these policies touch. So we kept the plan short intentionally because we want it to be usable and we want it to be something that our community can understand and digest. And it's something that can guide your, um, your body when you're making policy decisions in the future. Next slide, please. Um, I'll go into more detail on the replacement of the housing loss mitigation ordinance, but as I said earlier, this was one of the impetus of the Thriving in Place study. Um, several years ago, I was before the, the council and you um, directed us to include this in the Thriving in Place. At that time, it was just a, a dream of a gentrification study, but um, we are going to, the new policy is going to support tenants. It's going to preserve and create affordable housing and improve our data system. So I'll get into that in a little bit more detail here in a minute. Next slide, please. Um, there's foundational work that's already starting to happen based on the direction that you gave us in December and, and January on including some items within the mayor's recommended budget and also starting to work on the replacement of um, the housing loss mitigation ordinance. Um, some of these policies have already been worked on like the affordable housing incentives policy that the planning division has been working on for several years. And then um, you were so generous to grant funding this year for the tenant relocation assistance and also for the tenant resource navigation center in the budget process. Next slide please. Um, you can see here some of the other near-term action priorities. It's important to note that the near-term action priorities on the front of the placement are the exact same as the back of the placement, the two-year action plan, and then they're also outlined here within this um, project management graphic. Next slide. Um, we have proposed three city action teams. <clears throat> One is a tenant support, one is affordable housing development, an anti-displacement policy. Um, we have started reaching out to departments to form kind of our implementation team within the city. I think one of the big successes of Thriving in Place is that we did have representatives both um, from all of the departments working on this, but then we had kind of our core team that we were constantly course correcting to make sure that what we were proposing worked within the city structure and also pushed against that bubble a little bit as well. Next slide, please. Um, again, we don't, we can go into more detail on the two-year action plan here in a second. Next slide, please. This plan has gone through a 45-day community engagement plan after it was drafted, and we had um, 1,500 unique visitors. This engagement plan was from um, the beginning of June through the middle of July. There was strong support 
um, for the actions proposed. Um, we did make a few modifications based on feedback from the community and the Planning Commission, um, seeing more quantifiable goals. One of the things that we heard frequently from the public and from our community working group that I want to pass along to you is there is a strong desire to see publicly owned lands used to create affordable housing. Next slide, please. Um, one of the other questions that we got often because we were running these plans in tandem is how does Housing SLC and Thriving in Place work together? Um, housing SLC will be amended um, and Thriving in Place will be included as an addendum to Housing SLC and there were numerous policies that um, are in Thriving in Place that were included within Housing SLC. And then you can see here, these are the four goals um, that are in the adopted plan of Housing SLC and how they tie to the action priorities outlined within TIP. Next slide, please. Um, the community wants to be engaged with us and we started to build some really great partnerships and, and really holding space for people to be able to tell their story of the very traumatic experiences that some residents are facing being displaced from their communities. Um, so we want to continue that work and then there was also um, a lot of comment on the accessibility of the plan and, and making sure that people are able to access this. Once we have an adopted plan, we will make sure that we get this translated. Um, and our outreach materials on our website have been um, provided in numerous languages throughout. Uh, next slide, please. And um, we received a unanimous positive recommendation from the Planning Commission on July 26 to adopt Thriving in Place as the city's anti-gentrification strategy and mitigation plan and as an addendum to Housing SLC. With that, that concludes my presentation. Happy to answer any questions or get granular on any of the policies within Thriving in Place. Thank you, Director Price. Council members. Anyone want to jump in with questions first? Do question. Cooey, then Dugan. So I, I mean, I see number six here, uh, advocate at uh, the state level for the tenants uh, issue, and you know how much I talk about this, and and uh, um, and uh, I mean, many of us are potentially going in a few minutes to Sandy to talk, to, you know, with the Sandy City Council in a few minutes uh, about, you know. Uh, it, a shelter, uh, a potential shelter in the city of Sandy, uh, which uh, doesn't relate, but it, it, you know the idea is that we all on this together. Now, how can we better uh, serve our our residents by advocating at the state level? You know, the, the findings on the on the report uh, were shocking to all of us, right? Especially uh, related to the half of our uh, residents are rent burden. Uh, and it's it's you know it's leading uh, is a leading cause for displacement and uh, many of them becoming unsheltered. Um, how, how can we as a council uh, maybe direct our lobbying team, but also individually? How could we make a difference? Uh, I, I know there are legislators here in Salt Lake City understand this very much so, but how do we change the policy at the state level, which I think is part of the problem here? Too? Yeah, that's a great question, and I certainly appreciate the question in my role with the city of how we can work more closely with the legislature. Um, I think a great example is what you're going to do this evening, right, um, of having conversations with other cities and helping them see the importance of having affordable housing within their communities because the groundswell really happens where when all of a, the cities come together and say, we want this change to happen within our communities, um, and we're seeing we're seeing that traction happening, but certainly not as quick as as we would probably like here within the capital city. I think um, there's. I was on a panel last week. Um, talking about how we have focused so much of our attention on the production of affordable housing, which we need to continue focusing our attention there, but we have focused so little attention from a policy space on the 
um, keeping people in housing that they already have. And so there's conversations happening around funding the, preser the Utah Preservation Fund um, that happened in the Commission on Housing Affordability. But we really need to, um, I think, not shift, because I don't want to take the intention away from the development of affordable housing, but um, keeping people housed keeps people off of the streets. And so um, those are really conver really important conversations that we need to be having with our fellow communities and with our legislators. Councilmember Dugan and then Wharton. Uh, great question, and thank you for that, because I, I, I was going to my question is more on the uh, eviction side of the house. I think it's protection number one C about the services to provide them so that we keep them in the housing and back to the conversation with our state legislators and the other municipalities on how we uh, make sure that uh, there is protection so we don't wait until they're evicted to find them or wait till they're getting served papers instead of proactively helping them early on and how we can work with the legislators. But I think you've kind of answered that question at this point. But Yeah, I, I can add a little bit more to that. So there was a recent study done in California of people experiencing homelessness, and 82% um, of the respondents in that study said if they had five to $10,000 of emergency funding, they would not have been homeless. Um, that is a small drop in the bucket when we're considering the trauma and the um, the lifelong um, experience that somebody has even for a brief spell of homelessness. So I think those conversations are things that we need to be having both at the city level and at the state level. Um, there was also a recent study done by Jim Wood at Kempsey Gardner Policy Institute where he analyzed the state of Utah um, against all states within the country on four different um, policies. And one of them, we have a three-day pay or quit here in Utah, which means that when you are served to evict, that you're being evicted from your house, you have three days to get out. We recently were just able to change that to business days, which is helpful. But when somebody's in crisis and they have only three days to get out, and we have a 3% vacancy rate in Salt Lake County and double digit rent increases, it makes it really challenging for people to find housing. Um, we've heard from so many of our service providers that one of their biggest barriers is application fees. So there is some really easy, I don't wanna say easy, but there's some low hanging fruit here that isn't a very big cost investment that we could be advocating for um, you know, at, at the state level that would have a really big impact. Um, I just recently met with Seattle and they uh, changed their three-day pay or quit to 14 days. And that has made a tremendous difference within their difference within their community and it allows for the service providers to get in and mediate. Chair. Okay, we had council member Wharton and then Petra and, then and Baltimore, Baltimore. Oh, sorry. Um, this looks great, both of these, and I'm really excited to have this. Um, when I'm looking though at like 2013 or 2023, um, I feel like we're already behind. Um, and so what do we need to, um, I mean, this looks like it's gonna be like several budget amendments and like convening with other government partners and things like that, things that, um, yeah, I don't know. I think I look at first things first and it just, I, it feels like we're already kind of behind. And so what, what do we need to do right now um, other than pass the plan? Yeah. Like once we get that done. What that's do you a, think are the most important of these goals? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. So um, we have already um, drafted the community benefit policy, and it's currently out for 45-day public engagement, and we'll be going for before the planning commission in the beginning of November. That's the replacement of the housing loss mitigation ordinance. When um, Let me actually take a step back for a second. When we created the two-year action plan, 
we weighed many factors in the creation of this and part of it was we didn't want to have to come before this body and ask for a tremendous amount of staffing and funding increases so we wanted to pick policies that a we knew were really impactful and things that we've been hearing over and over and over again through the engagement process and through um, our interactions with you and the mayor um, but we also wanted to ensure that these were things that were mostly within our existing scope of services. So um, certainly some of these are going to stretch our staff thin. There's no doubt about that. Um, one thing that we continually hear is improvements to the um, tenant landlord initiative. That would require more staffing. We didn't put that on here, but that is something we could bump up, but it would require more staffing for business licensing. I, I think the other things that are on here um, are really focused on um, policies within the city. You guys were so gracious and um, put $92,000 in the budget this year for a tenant um, navigation center and then $180,000 for the tenant relocation assistance program. So we have that seed money already that we can start working on this. And a lot of the other stuff that's that's in here is ordinance, ordinance work and, pol and program work. Can we use any of the um, dormant HUD funds to pay for some of these costs? You know? That would probably be a question better directed at Tony if he's still. Can I, can I have Tony a answer that? <laughs> I am an, I'm not as involved in the dormant PI, so he can give you the most up-to-date information on that. Just very briefly that we are continuing to bring forward to council recommendations for the usage of both restricted and unrestricted dormant funds so to be continued. Really easy. Guys, do you think any of these are eligible for those funds, or can you not answer that just yet? Answer it just yet. Okay. All right. Um, Thank you. What are the implementation teams? The implementation teams. So, um, we are still working on what the details of that will be. I think that, and we, I would welcome your feedback on this. Um, one implementation team will be within the city, and I think it will be an extension of what I called our, our A team, which was the planning division, housing stability, RDA, CAN admin, um, the, the departments and divisions that really work on housing policy. Um, I do think that we ha would like to continue having conversations and having the community weigh in on the policies and I think that that was a really beneficial and it helped us course correct through the development of this plan so we envision that we will have an extension of that as well um, I don't know that it will be the same exact team that we've been working with but including the existing community working group has developers, it has community advocates. It was a pretty diverse group of people and it was super helpful. So I think we would want kind of a mix of both of those, but certainly would welcome any feedback from the council on that if you have. Councilmember Petro and then Councilmember Valdemoros. Um, thank you, and thank you for continuing to feed my passion for color coding. I love this. <laughs> um, so procedurally, um, well, like philosophically, everything on here looks amazing. I see the necessity for it. I hate creating independence when we can't deliver. So I'm concerned, we're asking a question about what does our adoption of this actually mean for us committing to either retaining in-house and paying for things? Is there a point in the future where we revisit this? The only thing that's clear to me from what I've seen that we are going to go externally for is the Regional Anti-Displacement Coalition and the Community Partnership. Are there other activities that we're looking to outsource, partner with people to to you know, maybe do pri public-private partnerships with. I'm just concerned because I know the number of things weighing on our general fund balance, and I want to do this well. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that concern. I think that's a really great question. So um, we haven't 
So I'm going to use the tenant relocation assistance program as an example. We were we received $180,000 as I mentioned this year through the budget process. We have started the conversations internally of what that program would look like and if that would be best managed by a community partner and through the funds were granted through the funding our future um budget so would it make the most sense for that to go through a community partner and have them run that program um you know we we don't we would have we have some staffing capacity but we are concerned about the same exact thing so each one of these items would come before you as we work on the implementation of them to say is this a priority and do we have budget to put towards this and as we start to dive into the specifics of each one of these um, new programs and policies or ramping up existing programs or policies or even just revisiting it do we want to continue doing this does this still work right because we constantly have to be recalibrating and there's metrics within the plan for us to be doing that um, we would be bringing those before you saying does it make sense for this to be an in-house does this make sense for this to be run by a community partner but certainly welcome any feedback I think I mean you run a nonprofit so you know the concerns of we certainly don't want to say oh we have funding for a year um, ramp up your staffing and we saw those challenges when we first rolled out rent assistance during the pandemic of the service providers were constantly trying to keep people staffed um, not knowing if they were gonna how long they were gonna have funding you know from from not just the city but from other partners as well as we were waiting for the HUD money to roll out so I think that's something that we need to be really cognizant of as we start getting into the details of these policies and programs so is it then fair to say that the under first things first the council adoption is a conceptual adoption and then we'll be involved later in execution stages to make sure that each one is being put on the correct shelf we just want to make sure this exists in the ecosystem whatever way it can exist strongest most sustainably for the community that's exactly it yeah thank you yep that's exactly it thank you council member excuse me if i oh, could just ahead. mention too since i mentioned at the beginning that um some of these implementation or full implementation of the plan would would um, mean a significant amount of city investment. Um, since I said that, I'll uh, I'll mention that a lot of that has to do with property acquisition. Mm -hmm. It's just that dwarfs almost any other expense. Yeah. Thank you, Allison. Hey, Angela, thank you so much. Um, I you know I had a question about this uh, three business. Um, eviction law that we were able to get to like it used to be three days and now it's business day so we move forward but any can you show any light on the logic of this rule this utah state rule um just yeah. a quick thing so that the public knows that it's not the city uh yeah. we're dealing like we need to comply obviously with this and so we're trying to help from different angles to mitigate this very short period of time where you need to leave um, yeah. your place yeah, I can speak to that. So um, the three-day pay or quit is, is within state code, and that means that a tenant has three days to vacate their property once they're served an eviction notice. And um, as I said, the Kempsey Gardner report analyzed other states, and we're the only, I think it's safe to say we're one of the only states within the country that has that short of a three of a pay or quit that doesn't have a rental subsidy program as well so most of the states that have a three-day pay or quit policy also have a tandem policy that runs with that where you can get the rent assistance we don't have that here in Utah and so it's kind of a double-edged sword for our tenants um, and then as I mentioned, having high vacancy rates and um, rent increases makes it, or I'm sorry, low vacancy rates and double digit rent increases makes it really challenging. Um, changing the three day pay or quit would be my dream as a policy director. Um, and I'll, that's not anything that I'm hiding to anybody that I think that would be one of the best things that we could do at the state level, if I'm being completely honest, to keep people in their housing. And it seems like I mean, I, I don't own property that I rent, but I, I feel like this is like an, an urgent matter. I mean, three days, you know, that's so there must be 
some you know some explanation or maybe we know what the explanation is but there has to be something else uh, or at least some sort of empathy i guess that's what i'm trying to say um, whoever are making those decisions and whoever owns property and is renting and you're abiding with this or supporting just you know um just take a moment and think about this three business day um you know rule that it's really harming our communities and the people that have to leave so throwing it out there in the world yeah so that i think listening. yeah i think that's a really important message and as i said i i saw um wayne niederhauser speak last week at the chamber event with mayor mendenhall and um, he has been starting to talk about prevention a lot as well. And so the message is starting to um, resonate. And going back to council members, council member Pui's initial question of what can we do? This is a big one of really speaking to keeping people in housing as a homeless prevention strategy. With our good, so on, along the same lines, with our good uh, tenant, good landlord, uh, program mm -hmm. can we ask or can we add that that eviction process is lo like longer so you add more days if you want to participate in that or is that completely uh, non possible because it's a state law and we cannot change that but this is our program and we subsidize it yeah um, I would want to have legal counsel answer that question specifically but what I'll say at a very general level with um, most things in state code is that if we offer incentives we typically aren't preempted I don't know if that's the case for this but for example inclusionary zoning we can't do but we can incentivize a developer through giving them additional density or okay. or whatnot to be able to include affordable housing but that's something that we can look into with our legal counsel and, and we can consider when we're looking at revamping the tenant landlord initiative mm -hmm. perfect and then sorry if you talked about this but the housing loss mitigation the, mm -hmm. the replacement of that can we talk or can we yes do ex explain that a little bit because i know a lot of the public talk about the housing loss mitigation plans what are we going to do how you know we used to have one it didn't work very well it's important that we talk about that and see what solutions yeah. Like what's the equivalent or what are we doing to replace that? Yeah, so I can um, dive into the replacement of the housing loss mitigation ordinance and I may have Nick Norris come up and join me for this as well because he's been working on drafting it. Um, so the replacement of housing loss mitigation is going to be what we're proposing is called the community benefit policy. It's going to consist of four amendments to the um, city code. Um, first, it will amend um, 1864. Yes, thank you, I couldn't remember, 64 or 67, which is the demolition ordinance. It will amend um, 1897, which is the housing loss mitigation ordinance. It will create a new title called Title 19, which is for general plans, and it will amend 21A50, which is the amendments title within the city code the um the kind of foundation of the policy is that when an applicant comes to the city and asks for a zoning map or a general plan amendment that we could request a community benefit and that community benefit could be affordable housing it could be historic preservation it could be um, infrastructure open space there's a whole list of things and this would be at your discretion as the city council to negotiate through a development agreement what that community benefit would be it requires the replacement if you're demo demolishing housing units that you replace those housing units like for like meaning same number of bedrooms and same rent it also requires the um, the tenant relocation assistance be provided to individuals that are displaced and this is a really important piece for me to hover on for a second this is separate from the tenant relocation assistance that you funded at the hundred eighty thousand dollars so this tenant relocation assistance would be something that developer would pay to the applicant or I'm sorry to the tenants that are being displaced the money that we have in that hundred and eighty thousand dollar pot is relocation assistance that if somebody um, goes through their 
um, the rent has increased substantially, then they could potentially come to the city and ask for relocation assistance to find a new apartment. Um, it also, we, we phase two will be looking at a community preference policy where if you are displaced from your housing, that you could potentially be first in the queue to move back to that neighborhood so that we can preserve. That's not included in this first draft, but that's something that we would like to consider in the future. Um, as I said, this is currently out for 45 day public engagement and will be coming before you guys um, maybe this year or the first part of next year. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. Angela, I just wanted to say thank you for your, you and your team's work on this. I know it has not been a small task. Um, and I think, I believe this is a all hands on deck problem. And so I, I appreciate that you've, you've put, separated this into these six different categories. And I just wanted to offer that I, I think there's, we all probably on the council and in the city and different departments have different expertise and I'd love to help with um, figuring out things like the community land trust 2C or how short term rentals impact housing 2D the entire column of three, uh, producing more housing. Um, and then, so let us know, let me know how I can help with that um, and use use us and let's, let's move this as quickly as possible. And I appreciate that it is so broad because I think we all have different strengths and ideas and sort of expertise from um, our constituents or our, our professional lives that can help move these things forward and, um, I, I'm sure this is not the full list of things that we have to do, but it seems like a pretty good broad list of things, of places to start. And as we move forward, I, this is a big task and we don't have a lot of time to wait. So the other thing is that the things that we have on our plate, I will for the remaining seven meetings or whatnot that I'm chair, make sure that we're prioritizing getting those things scheduled. And I hope that the next chair will do the same. Because these things are not, these are not things that we can that we have time, we're, we're already behind in that. As Council Member Wharton mentioned, even on this chart that you've made that's really pretty, we feel like we're behind, but in the, the broad context of the problem that exists in our city, we're even more behind. So um, that's my commitment to help with this. Uh, I think a couple of us are gonna leave. I'm gonna turn the chairing of the meeting over to Vice Chair Petro, um, but we don't need to stop this. I think Councilman Dugan had a comment, but I'll let Councilman or Vice Chair Petro take over from here. Thank you. Thank you. It's really hard being both a public servant and a concerned constituent of the place in which you live. All right. Okay. Council members, does anyone else? Yeah. Council Member Dugan. Appreciate all this. This is uh, in the eviction side of the house. I, you and I will, and Councilman Pizza will have to work on some actions there. I think I have some actions in that, that re regard, so I appreciate that. My next question is really on the, uh, to be on the, uh, I guess the preserved side of the house. And, you know, we, we want to keep people in housing, but we also want to make sure that they have, they're in livable housing and they're not having issues with their, their housing and the quality of, you know, just the safety of their house and the health and safety of their housing. So. In the, in the staff report, it talked about two being, being one of the more expensive uh, endeavors we need to go through, but making sure the housing is uh, safe and livable and uh, the rehabilitation of that housing, more of the inside of it than just the full structure of it. Is there, is there plans or is there a way that, that it's uh, broken down into like, categories on that cost and maybe we want to uh, tackle these health ones first sides and then the bigger one second is that part of the plan here or yeah i appreciate that question we haven't gotten that granular let um when we created the two-year action plan we didn't want to tie specific budget requests to it as much as just kind of showing through dollar signs like these are more um fiscally conservative 
policies that we could work on versus the more expensive ones. I will say that one of the things that I've heard a lot from tenants is um, fear of retaliation and coming to the city saying, hey, my unit is substandard. And so um, we've heard a lot of requests of could the city create a rehab program um, that would both an inspection program that we would just do random inspections and, and look at housing units and so there isn't this retaliation um, mentality or this retaliation that happens. And then also, um, could the city invest some money in rehabbing naturally occurring affordable housing and maybe deed restricting it or putting some sort of restricted covenant on it so that it would stay as such? So those are some of the things that we've heard from the community that I think would be things that you guys could consider in the future as we start to look towards that and then this action item is, is has a lot of ties to the RDA as well and the work that they do in property acquisition um, and so I think there's a, just a lot of opportunity for us to consider different things that we want to do there okay thank you and Madam Chair uh, on, on the funding side of the house uh, item 4a talks about new taxes on short-term rentals does this does the state need to approve this new tax or is it something that, I mean, I gotta think they have to approve this new tax and can we use, how can we use that funding? Can we use that funding to fund something of like the uh, rehabilitation? Yeah, so um, currently we have a, short-term rentals are supposed to be business, are supposed to receive business licenses within the city. And I don't believe that any of them actually do have a business license. So I think that some of the work that you guys did earlier this year when you passed the ADU ordinance and added um, additional FTEs to code enforcement will help be the city to be a little bit um, more proactive as our, our code enforcement team has been stretched super thin and can only really enforce cases that are coming before them. I think as we look at our tenant landlord initiative program and changes to that, we certainly would look at some um, fees and some different structures there to be able to generate some revenue that could go into like a housing trust fund model. Um, but there's no specifics there. There was, a, as you know, a bill this session um, that didn't pass that would have potentially, if a city would have opted in, um, could have received some revenue from short-term rentals, but that bill didn't pass. Mm -hmm. Council members, I don't want to push us too hard, but we're significantly behind schedule. Do we, are there any substantive, I think this is like, one of the most important things we'll do while we're on council. So I don't want to shortchange it, but I also do want to move forward. <laughs> okay, Angie, if we have questions that invariably will come up at three o'clock in the morning, I will remember the question I am not asking you right now. Um, are we, it's okay for us to reach out to you and, and to get more clarification? Yes, of course. And Allison's been really wonderful. And um, to your point, I just want to say that this has been, um, such an incredible opportunity to work on this plan and I hope that you all feel um, in addition to the mayor that this is going to have a generational impact on our residents here in Salt Lake City um, with the investments that you've already made in this framework that we have here. This is a really good roadmap for us for the next few years to start unraveling the um, inequities and displacement that we've been having in our communities for many, many, many decades. Angie, thank you not only for the work, Angela, sorry, I keep going. Thank you for the work, not even that you're not just leading out on here, but how you have an impact beyond here with your work with the league and making sure that we know that we're all interconnected and it's really comforting to know that your expertise is going to help a lot of people. So thank you so much for the work. Thank you for that, I appreciate the time. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions. All right. Uh, Council, I'm going to attempt to get through these three appointments before dinner. <laughs> okay, Lisa? Do we have Lisa Kehoe here? There she is. Sorry, I was looking for you. I was like scanning. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Lisa. We are here for the advice and consent for Lisa to officially become our 911 Dispatch Executive Director. So Lisa, I'll give you a few minutes to
tell us about yourself for those of us who haven't had time to interact with you so much? Gosh, okay. Me in a nutshell. Well, a little bit louder? Okay. Go oh, easy, I'm a little nervous. Gosh. Okay. <laughs> Uh, in a nutshell, I guess you could say, I could give you the short version. I've been here 18 months. I've been in dispatch for 16 years. But uh, I guess a, a better way to explain me is that I'm just like everybody in this room, as far as someone that's been in desperate times of need and have had to make that terrible phone call. I've been the dispatcher, and I've just, from the bottom all the way to the top, and I'm just super honored to be here and excited to take care of these people. I kind of have a mother hen approach. I can't really get away from that. <laughs> I've already been in the position of acting for about six months now, and I've gotten a little bit protective of our, of our group, and I'm excited to see where we can take it. And I am more than honored and excited just to be part of this city because it's beautiful, it's innovative. I've enjoyed coming as work sessions, and I share the passion that you all have for the same community that you're representing, and I just be honored to do the same. Thank you, Lisa. Council, any questions, comments? Just one, just one comment. Lisa, I love our, our conversation we had uh, last week or sometime, whenever that was. Uh, we really appreciate that, and I love your energy, and I love your passion for the position, and uh, I, I look forward to your future work. Likewise, thank, thank you. Thank you. Lisa, I know that but dispatch is a hard job, and especially with us diversifying response models and trying to serve our constituents, it, it only gets more difficult. So you have my gratitude for doing the job and my respect for stepping in at this moment in history and being willing to do it. All right. So this is, an, a, this is a consent agenda thing, oh, correct? Madam Chair, I just want to, oh. I don't have a question either. I just want to wish you the best of luck and, um, and give you our confidence and, um, I think you'll be great, and I love that you have that experience at working at all levels of the department, and so um, wish you well in this new position. Thank you so much, and I, if I could just say, I said it's a difficult task, all the different diverse models, but it's not difficult, it's challenging, and this city is just leading the way, and it's nice to be an outsider coming in to see that kind of progress, and I'm really excited to be a part of that, so I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. We are so lucky. So we'll be convening the limited formal later, and we'll all be voting. You don't have to be here, but if you want to come, you know, we can pop a bottle in the back. <laughs> Madam Thank Chair. You. Of, of sparkling grape juice. I love grape juice. <laughs> Madam Chair. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Lisa. You. I'm sorry, Madam Chair, if I could just make a point of clarification. Because this is the appointment of a department director, it is on an unfinished business item and not consent. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. All right, next we'll move to the Police Civilian Review Board and Elizabeth Hanna, who I believe is here virtually. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi there. Hey, so if you want to take just a minute or two, tell us why you're interested in this work and introduce yourself to us. Yes, excuse my outfit. I was gardening after work, so I don't normally just wear sleepless t-shirts, but yeah, I um, am a nurse practitioner and I, so I've always worked with the community one way or another in my profession, but I wanted to, and it, especially during COVID, I was kind of looking for a different way to engage with the community. And I started looking at board um, positions and obviously this one was not really being filled during that time, but I was excited when I applied this year and got um, considered for it. And I think that, you know, with my background in health, it's really important to engage with your community as part of health, that it's not just individual choices. So this one was really exciting for me. And I think that the Civilian Police Review Board is nice because it you know, gives some accountability and transparency for civilians as to what goes on with the police department. And obviously that's kind of a fraught topic at this day and age. And I think that it's a nice way to give some assurance of quality for the police within the community and make sure that there's good communication and um, you know like a good relationship between the community and the police and make sure that the quality is is good especially if there are kind of high profile cases to know that there are just regular people that are on the board looking into that to make sure that people feel like okay my taxpayer money is going to good things and the people are actually looking into this um, I think that that's really important so that was why I wanted to do it thank you so much Council members, any questions, comments? 
Thank you so much for being willing to serve our community with your experience and expertise. Uh, you'll be on the consent agenda and you don't have to be present, but thank okay. you and we look forward to seeing what you do on the commission. Thank you, I appreciate it. Next, we have Isaac Astill for an appointment to the Transportation Advisory Board. Good evening, Council. Part, yeah. Good, thanks. Same thing as her. A few minutes. Uh, my name is Isaac Astle. I'm uh, the new Executive Director of Auxiliary Services for Salt Lake City School District. Uh, my predecessor, Paul Schulte, was on the Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, I have over 20 years of transportation experience, uh, being new at the district, but I previously did that. I was uh, Director of Public Services for West Jordan City, and for six years I was under the tutelage of Lisa Schaefer here uh, in public services as well, and before that another 15 years with uh, University of Utah and University of Mississippi doing the same thing. Thank you. If you're a if you're a student of Lisa Schaefer, I, I hear all I've heard all I need to hear. So, <laughs> council, any other comments? Go ahead. I just want to say thank you, not just for your service in terms of being a part of this advisory board, um, but also related to the students of Salt Lake City. Um, I know putting a child on a school bus is such a scary thing for parents the first time they have to do it. And just really appreciate the fact that you make sure our kids are safe as they're getting to and from school, the trip they take most often every year. Thank you. I'm, I'm lucky to have a great team that I've been gifted basically, um, but we, we have a great team and they do a, a great job at everything that they, they take the responsibility of taking care of those children. Thank you. All right, thank you. So you'll be on the consent agenda. You don't have to stick around and good luck. Thank you. All right, so council, we are, uh, we recovered a lot of time. We're only 12 minutes behind. So I vote that, I vote that we still take 30 minutes for dinner. Do you agree? Yeah. We, we've, we, have brain, we have brain shrapnel after all the stuff we've covered. All right, 30 minutes for dinner. We'll come back at 47. Thank you so much for giving us that break. We are going to move on now with the alley vacation at approximately 2167 South, 800 East. Um, we're going to invite Brian Fulmer. Brian, are we hearing both of these alley vacations as one package? Or are they going to be separate? They are two separate okay. vacations. Okay. So we'll do them separately. All right. So we have Brian Fulmer, Diana Martinez, John Anderson. And John Anderson. Thank you so much. And these are separate, but they are right next to each other. So they have a lot in common. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, this is a proposal to vacate a segment of city-owned alley adjacent to properties at 801, 809, 815, and 825 East Wilmington Avenue, which is approximately 2170 South in Council District 7. This alley segment, as John mentioned, is adjacent to another alley segment, which is the subject of the next briefing. The western end of the alley has been used for more than 20 years as a driveway for the property at 2167 South 800 East. I believe the applicant is in the audience and available for questions. And with that, I'll turn it over to Diana. Hello. Good evening. It's so late. <laughs> okay. So the first one is 2167 South 800 East. Um, we just, oh, who am I else? Yep. Oh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. So just to reiterate what Brian went over, this uh, alley runs, it runs, excuse me, east to west between Commonwealth Avenue and Wilmington Avenue. Um, the portion that we're talking about right now is only 7.3 feet wide by 157 feet, if you will. Um, it has not been used, and we have looked at it through aerial uh, photography for about 20 plus years. It has basically been a driveway for 2167. Um, the width, can I have the next slide, please? The next width, if you can see on this first left picture, there's a little dotted green line. That shows that width. So from that to that fence is about 7.3 feet. And that is the, the public right of way, Ellie. So it's, it's obviously too narrow for a modern car. 
it could be opened up for pedestrians or bikers, but it would never fit a car. And then the other part of it um, belongs to the, to the owners of 2167. The picture on the right is showing the fence, so that chain link fence is kind of the end of it, and then there's a, a wooden fence to the back of it. So it has been blocked by a fence for quite a while. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, the Planning Commission did vote 10 to 1 to send a positive recommendation to have this vacated. At that time, we had put, staff had put a condition that a utility easement would be um, established in place of the existing public right-of-way for utilities and anything else that went through their phone cable. Um, in talking with the city attorney's office, that was done by the city attorney's office. So we have taken that out and we're still dealing with that to try to get that um, easement in place. So that will be done. And I think if I could have the next slide, please. And then this shows just the process through the LA vacation, which I'm sure you're all aware of. Um, the four check marks or properties, those would be the people that would get the property from that 7.3 feet of alleyway. Um, the, the X marks 2167 South 800 East. They would not have rights to it because they're not in the subdivision that's, that created that alleyway. And so they would, if, in, you know, if they did want to keep it as their driveway, they would have to purchase it from the other property owners. They get it. So that's all. Thank you. Um, council members? Questions? Just, just to clear it up, so the 2167 uses that portion of the alleyway, but the uh, alleyway would be vacated to the four units, four lots south of that. That are on uh, Wilmington Avenue, that are correct. On Wilmington yes. Avenue. And they're not okay. Because they are part of the subdivision that created that alleyway. Are we setting ourselves up for really, really tense hearings? Is this going to become? I don't think so. There, it wasn't. There was a few people that came to talk about it, but I think overall the Planning Commission felt very comfortable with their recommendation to you. Um, it, uh, I think you know one Planning Commissioner did have an issue with the fact of closing an alleyway, but this has been closed for 25 years. It has never been through, you know, passable. And so I think at that point you kind of have to think, you know, and really 7.3 feet isn't going to do a lot to help that, that passable situation. Anyone else? All right. I think you're off the hook. Good. Do you want to talk to the applicant? So the applicant is not here. The owner of 2167 is here, but he has been collaborating on this application. If you had any other questions for him. Council, would you like to hear? Otherwise, we can move on to the next section. Yeah, do, is, there, is there material information they want to present? If you're, if you're happy, I think we're happy. <laughs> All right. Great. Thank you so much. Then let's move on to the next alley vacation just nearby at approximately 827 East and Wilmington Avenue. The Dream Team remains at the table. Thanks, Madam Chair. This is a proposal to vacate the segment just east of the one we just discussed, and it is adjacent to properties at 825, 827, and 829 East Wilmington Avenue. Then on the other side of the alley, the properties at 820, 826, and 830 East Elm Avenue. The alley, as stated before, is approximately 2160 South. To the west is the other alley segment that we just discussed, which begins at 800 East. The alley continues east from this segment to 900 East, but that portion of the alley is not part of the proposal to vacate, and that section would remain open. And with that, I'll turn it over again to Diana. So this one on the, the map that you see is the, the yellow section, the yellow line. And this one is a little bit different because it is 17.3 feet. So it could accommodate a, um, a modern vehicle. Um, but again, you've got the orange section that would not. So um, again, on the, 
The yellow section, it has been blocked by dirt that had changed the grade. It had had fences. It has protruding fences. It has protruding accessory buildings that have been there for many years. So the, the alleyway has never been utilized in 20 plus years. And, and that goes for this section as well. Um, beyond the yellow would remain open. And there are some um, properties at the very eastern part of the alleyway that do use the alley to access garages. Can I have the next slide, please? So this is kind of looking at, so the, going left to right, um, the left photo is the very end of this section of the yellow section of the alleyway. Um, you can see how this fence on the, the left protrudes, actually a little bit of that, I believe a little bit of that accessory building does as well. On the right picture, that black fence protrudes. Next slide, please. Hold on, could you go back to that? Oh. Oh, sorry, sorry. 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 Yep. Yeah, yeah, that picture right here. So this wooden fence line is, is, is in the orange section. Is in the yellow section. The previous picture. The, okay, this, yeah. is a, this is the previous section. Yeah, okay. the bigger section. And that f the uh, fencing in the back there, the trees, that's the uh, east wall of the yellow section? Of the other alley vacation? Yes. Yes, exactly. Okay, so that's just from that wooden fence to the one on the right fence, that is the seven and a half feet. That actually... Um, Maybe a little bit less than seven and a half feet because that wooden fence is a little bit. Okay, so but into that's it. that's the this left hand picture, the uh, stuff on the right of the wooden fence, that is the yellow section of the of the uh, pit, of the uh, map. Correct, the second section. Yeah. And then the uh, right hand picture is looking from the opposite direction or the same nope, direction. we're just kind of backing backing up. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So next slide would be another backup. So the left, I'm just kind of walking back towards the east. Um, and then the, the picture on the right is just a little bit more to the east showing you the entire. And that, that's pretty much, at the point of that picture on the right, that is kind of the ending point of the second LA Vacation application. And then next slide, please. And then the one on the left, shows more of the entirety of the, the alley and then the one on the right is the most eastern part of it and this shows the couple of properties that actually access it to their garages and then next slide please on this one the planning commission voted five to two to send a positive recommendation and again there wasn't um, a lot of discussion in the hearing I, we did pick up one more commissioner that kind of felt like the alley, vac you know, alley vacation was not necessary and probably shouldn't happen, but <clears throat> overall it was a p positive recommendation to you. And then the next slide, please. And then this one is a little different because of the width of the property, um, all six would get part of this alley vacation, would, would take the, the property, so they would split it in half of what they abut. So, Madam Chair, in this case, so if we could say we want to clear this alleyway all the way out, it could be used for cars to get into those lots for the first three, uh, six residents on the east side, and then a walkable path all the way through to uh, 800 east, correct? Possible, but one of the situations that has has occurred because this has not been used fully, you know, beyond kind of a midpoint to the west, um, has been that it, it, it hasn't been taken care of for a long time. Right. And so there would need to be a lot of cleanup and this, a lot this, of... The city would do a lot, have to do a lot of They'd cleanup. have to do a lot and they'd have to do a lot of readjustment of fencing. And they'd have to put a... F I don't know if they'd have to put a fence, but they would, they'd have to have a line that says on the 2167, house right there, I mean and he would lose quite a bit of that the driveway that he has used for many years right right okay and the the alleyway to a point it's really kind of the first maybe 50 feet after that it's not it's not covered it's it, it's barely a hard surface if right, that it looks like the it was really more dirt. yeah it's dirt for a, for most of it right, right. 
Council member, and just you know, just for any of those encroachments, they would actually be the property owner's responsibility to remove. We would go through the um, the enforcement process to let them know that they are encroached in the right of way. Right. Um, they'd be given a certain amount of time, but they would be on on the owners to remove those fences, buildings, or anything, and shape that alley back up to where okay. it was. Okay, Councilmember Young. So, just for my clarification, so all six property owners support this petition. Is that correct? All correct. All signed. Yep. Council members, any other questions? And the applicant is different on this, this application, and he's here as well if you had any questions for him. Is there any material information you want to contribute? Or? Come, come on up and grab a microphone. And please uh, say your name for the record, please. Rusty Ballo. And the only thing I would add is that Interestingly enough, most of the alleys in this way actually run north-south, and this alley happens to run east-west. And a block away, you have the S-Line tracks, which has a perfect walkable path. And so the effort that it would take to restore this alley when you've got such a nice spot to walk regardless, just a block away, wouldn't make a whole lot of sense, it seems like. So anyway, just thought I'd add that. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you all for being here this evening. All right, Council, if that's it. Thanks for uh, putting dismissed. us in on a busy night. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. All right. We are removing item number nine from the agenda tonight, which brings us to the report of the chair and vice chair, the capital asset uh, plan. Um, I have no report. Uh, executive director. No announcements for them either. Um, so we are now going to move into a limited formal. Do I have to adjourn the work session? Oh, so we are going to, can we vote for that? Or do I just get to call it? Okay. So I'm going to call for a recess to this work session so we can convene in a limited formal. And now that we're in our work session, we are going to move into closed session for the purposes of attorney client matters. Is that accurate? Advice of counsel. Or advice of counsel. All right, advice of counsel. Uh, Madam Chair, I move that we uh, enter closed session for the purpose of receiving advice of counsel. Second. I have a motion from Council Member Horton, a second from Council Member Valdemoros. Uh, Council Member Dugan? Yes. Baldemoros? Yes. Horton? Young? Yes. All right, the motion carries five to zero with Pui and Mono absent. Uh, we are now moving into closed session. If you are not pertinent to the business, thank you for being here, but we'll see you later. <laughs> and Madam Chair, just to confirm, are you reconvening after the closed session? Let's just adjourn from closed session, please. Thank you. <laughs>